What's going on guys? Today we are going to be deriving the equations of motion using a little bit of calculus. I'm going to probably be making another one of these videos where I do it using nothing but algebra, but this one is catering towards physics majors and we're going to use calculus. So let's get started. So we're going to start off with an equation that everyone is familiar with right here. 4th equals mass times acceleration. Now, if we take the acceleration term and we define that as the time derivative of velocity, then we can multiply both sides by dt, and we get that a dt is equal to dv. Now, this is a very approachable differential equation that we can solve if we just integrate both sides, and that's what we're going to do. So if we take the integral of a dt, that's equal to the integral of dv. And our limits of integration that we're going to place on this system is we're going to go from 0 to some time t. And for the dv, we're going to go from some initial velocity to some final velocity. Great. So after we carry out this integral, we see that there's no time term already in this, so it's just going to be at minus 0. So this is going to be at is equal to vf minus vi. Another way that we can write that is vf is equal to vi plus at. And there we have our first equation of motion. All right, great. So we just derived the first equation of motion. We're actually going to use that to derive the next equation. Now, the next equation is going to come from uh, defining what velocity is in the same way that we initially defined what acceleration was and we got the first equation. So if we define uh, some velocity equal to a change in position over a change in time, we're going to do the exact same thing where we multiply by dt. We get v dt is equal to some differential change in position. Now instead of going ahead and integrating right away, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this v in for the vf that we used for equation 1. So if we do that, then we get vi plus at dt is equal to some differential change in position. And now we're going to integrate. So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate over t again, and it's just going to go from 0 to t. So let's go ahead and just throw that in there. Position is going to go from some initial position to some final position. Go figure. Now the vi doesn't have a t attached to it, so that's just going to be the integral of vi with respect to t is just going to be vt. We already have the t parameter in this term here, so the integral of t with respect to t is going to be t squared over 2. So this term is going to be plus 1 half at squared. And then the integral of dx from xi to xf is just going to be xf minus xi. And that's just the same thing as delta x. And there we have the second equation of motion. Okay, the third equation of motion isn't necessarily trickier to derive, but it's got a few more steps to it. So if there was one that you wanted to commit to memory, this would be the one, but the whole purpose of this video is to make sure that we don't have to memorize anything anymore. This isn't a history class. In order to derive the third and final equation of motion, let's take bits and pieces of what we've already derived. We know that uh, acceleration is equal to the change in velocity with respect to time, and we also know that velocity is equal to a change in position with respect to time. Now, if we solve for dt in both cases, we get that dt is equal to dv over a, and we get that dt is also equal to dx over v. Okay, so since we know that dt is defined as the differential change in velocity with respect to a constant acceleration, and it's also equal to a differential change in position with constant uh, velocity, well that means that these two quantities must be equal to each other. So we're going to set them equal to each other. So if we get rid of this part, 
we can now say that dv over a is equal to dx over v. Okay, uh, we're going to do some cross multiplication and we get v dv is equal to a dx. Great. So the last step here is to just integrate both sides. So we're going to integrate this with respect to v and this with respect to x. This is going to go from some initial velocity to some final velocity. The only time you'll have a zero for your first uh, part of the limit of integration is if there's a time quantity. You always start at t equal to zero, but if it's position, velocity, or acceleration, you're starting from initial to final. There's no constraint that says that the thing that you're measuring has to start from stationary position. Um, okay, great. So this is going to go from some initial position to some final. So when we integrate v dv, the integral of v with respect to dv is just going to be v squared over 2. So this is going to be v squared over 2 from vi to vf. Since there is no x term attached to the a, the integral uh, with respect to dx is just going to be the difference of the limits. So it's just going to be a xf minus xi. And this whole thing really is just delta x. So that's what we're going to call it at the end. But for now, this is fine. OK, so if we substitute in our limits of integration into our evaluated integral and just call this term delta x, we get 1 half uh, vx squared minus vi squared is equal to a delta x. OK, if we just multiply that 2 over, we get vf squared. We get vf squared minus vi squared is equal to 2a delta x. And finally, vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2. And that is our third and final equation of motion. And this is arguably one of the most powerful ones because it sort of contains the other two, right? We used information from the other two to get to this conclusion. Uh, the one bit of information that's hidden is you'll notice that there's no time dependence. And that's why this third equation is, some kind, is sometimes known as the time independent equation of motion. And there we have all three equations of motion derived. Uh, if you found this video helpful, let me know. And if you want to see this derived using algebra instead of calculus, feel free to ask for that as well. I think that would be a fun challenge. Um, also, if, if you have any ideas of other equations uh, that you'd like to see derived because you've been told to just memorize it, let me know as well because everyone should derive every equation at least once, as long as you're a physics major. If you just have to take one class, it might not be necessary to derive all four of Maxwell's equations in integral and differential form. But these equations, you'll see that it took no time at all, and I hope it did help you understand how Newton got to these. Thanks.